Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, welcome back. Thank you very much for your patience. Technology is great when it works. So thanks for bearing with us as we work through some technical challenges. We do have the chairman uh, back with us. He is uh, going to be using his phone, so there will be no video. We've got a good solid connection though for his audio, which is the most important thing. So um, once again, I'm Peter Knutson. I'm the public affairs lead for this, for this board meeting. And the purpose again is uh, to allow the chairman to uh, make a couple of remarks about this morning's meeting and then, of course, take your questions. Um, the spelling of his name, for those of you who may uh, be just joining us, is Robert uh, L. and then Sumwalt, S-U-M-W-A-L-T. Um, and then with him is the lead investigator, and that's Elliot, E-L-I-O-T-T -T Simpson, S-I-M-P-S-O-N. Um, again, if we have any further technical challenges, we will put out a tweet with a new uh, a link to a new session, but hopefully we've got everything in a good place now. Now to ask a question, select the question icon on the upper right hand of your screen. The icon is depicted with a question mark in a box. So type your question along with your name and affiliation and submit it, and then I will read the questions to the chairman. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Chairman Simwalt. Peter, thank you very much, and uh, I, I'm deeply sorry for all the technical problems that I've had since the board meeting, and uh, sort of lets the air out of any uh, excitement that, that we might have had for the press briefing, uh, media briefing. But I do want to say that today's board meeting and the work that staff has done to develop this aviation investigation report, I think it really highlights that there, the FAA needs to impose a higher level of regulatory requirements and oversight for these revenue passenger carrying Part 91 flights. We really have put out six recommendations. Uh, and, and, and really, if I were to characterize those recommendations in non-legal terms, uh, I would say that really what we're looking for and what we've asked the FAA to do is one, have different, um, a different regulatory framework, a more robust framework for these types of operations. Another thing is that we'd like for them to do is to identify shortcomings in the current regulatory structure. Um, another is that we want them for these revenue, revenue passenger carrying flights under part 91 to develop an SMS. We want better guidance for the FAA inspectors when providing surveillance of these types of operations. And basically, we also want a database of these operators so that the FAA will know where they're located so that they can do better surveillance. So that, in a nutshell, is what we have come out with today. And I'd be glad to uh, take your questions at this point. Sure, so I'll go ahead and read uh, the first question from, from Glenn Moyer, editor of the Balloon Federation of America. What is the significance of the amendment to today's adopted report to reiterate and reclassify A17045 regarding medical certificates for balloon pilots? What action would you expect the FAA to take to address this issue and how soon? Yeah, it's a great question. I wanna go back and and look at that particular recommendation because as member Hamidi pointed out, it really has nothing to do with the with the with with our recommendation for and the congressional requirement for commercial balloon pilots to have a medical certificate. What this recommendation is is specifically saying, and we've reiterated it and we've reclassified it. It's really something the FAA should be able to do without too much trouble. Analyze your current policies, procedures, and tools for conducting oversight over commercial balloon operations. Uh, and so that's really the long and the short of it right there. And uh, I, uh, as you heard in the, in the deliberation, the FAA has not responded to us since uh, I think it was uh, 2018. And, um, and so that would be the reason for reclassifying it to an unacceptable response at this point. 
Next question, Peter. Yes, yeah, so from Juan Brown uh, with a YouTube aviation channel, is the NTSB recommending that some of these Part 91 revenue operations in question go straight FAR Part 135? If so, which operations in particular? In, in particular, uh, air tour operations. Uh, we think that uh, there are so many loopholes in the um, in the requirement for a for an LOA that um, we feel that maybe that is a better way to go. It's part 135. Uh, Elliot, would you like to chime in there with uh, with some comments on that? Yeah, no, that's correct. And we've we've taken great steps to um, in in the development of this report to let everyone know that we're not recommending a wholesale move over to part 135. You know, we're following up the pre-existing recommendation which is A, A 1931, which does talk about LOA air tours. And we can we continue to believe that the best position for them is in the part 135 sphere. But we're not making that recommendation for the other revenue ca passenger carrying operations that we're talking about. We're talking about operationally specific regulations for those different areas that we're discussing. Thank you, thank you, Elliot. And yes, the the recommendation A-19-31, which we reiterated today, does call for the FAA to develop and implement national standards within part 135 or equivalent for all air tour operations with powered airplanes or rotorcraft to bring them under one set of standards. Uh, we've seen too many loopholes uh, in exploitations of the uh, Part 119E uh, um, exemption for uh, for these uh, um, types of operators. If there's a follow up for that, uh, I'll take it. But Peter, otherwise, the, uh, the next one, please. Sure. Uh, the next one's from Caitlin Burchell of the NBC affiliate in, uh, I'm guessing that's CT, so it's Connecticut, I guess. Um, can you help me break down a timeline for our viewers? How long do you expect until NTSB creates a final draft of recommendations? Or I think maybe she means publish these recommendations. And how long does the FAA have to respond to these recommendations? Yeah, great question. So this report, uh, we adopted it today. So the report and then there's one addition that staff will circulate to us in the coming days to better justify the amendment that member Hamadi made for the one regarding commercial balloons. So the report itself will be published within about four weeks. Um, and uh, the FAA has 90 days to respond, but that response can be simply, thank you for your letter we uh, will consider this and get back with you. I mean, that's really all they have to do in their response. We have found that, uh, that, that the FAA um, sometimes is not as expeditious with acting on these, on these recommendations as we would like for them to be. And uh, that's one of the things we would like to improve is their response time to actually uh, implement these recommendations. If they say they're going to implement it, uh, and there's no debate about that, then then th then they need to go ahead and move and, and implement. It's oftentimes it's not a not a question of whether or not they want to do it. It's a question of how long does it take them to end up doing it, and that's where sometimes things get bogged down. And, and Caitlin has a follow-up question about the flights, uh, type of flights discussed this morning. Are these uh, still taking off daily? And if so, how concerning is this for the NTSB? Well, they are taking off daily. And I want to stress that uh, I would imagine that the majority of these flights are operating um, in accordance with the regulations and doing so safely. But unfortunately, we at the NTSB see the cases that don't work out well, and and we're concerned about that. We, you know, again, in our in this aviation investigation report that we adopted today, we looked at eight such accidents where where the regulations were were exploited, or there were exceptions, or exemptions, or omissions, and so. Uh, we, we want to close those gaps. We want the FAA to close those gaps. Want to reiterate, come back to the point, 
I, I imagine and I hope that the majority of these flights are operated uh, in accordance with the regulations and are being done safely. But we've seen cases where they have not. There have been extreme cases where people have lost their lives, and we need to correct that. Mr. Chairman, the next question is from Greg uh, Wallace at CNN. He has two questions. I'll, I'll read them separately. Uh, so the first one is, uh, uh, until the FAA acts, what can sightseers, skydivers, and the like do to determine the safety level of their operator? That's a great question. And I, I guess, sorry if I answered the first one first, but uh, without having you answer this, uh, ask the second one. But as Member Hamidi pointed out, there's not a lot that, that somebody can do. It's not like some things where you can look for a good housekeeping seal of approval or you can go on a website and, and see who has the best uh, safety rating. Unfortunately, there's really no good way for, um, for a potential customer or potential passenger to, to look at this and, and, and to examine the safety levels. And that's why it's so important that we have the FAA doing their job, which is to ensure the safety of the traveling public or participants in this type of operation. So that's why, we've, why we really believe it's up to the FAA to step up and, and come up with a different regulatory framework and enforce that, that new, new framework. And Greg's uh, uh, second question on a separate issue is, is there an update uh, on the, uh, the NTSB's work on the United Airlines engine uh, event incident from February? No, there's no update on that. We published an update on that about uh, 10 days ago, and, and that is the latest. And as always, uh, as we get uh, uh, significant information on that, we will, we will release it. Uh, the next question is from Warren Morningstar at AOPA. Are you suggesting that local air tour operators, the solo operator flying near the airport, should be 135? Well, we've seen too many uh, loopholes where people are getting around uh, the these sorts of um, regulations that are in place. And so we feel that uh, there needs to be be a change, and that's why we re reiterated the recommendation today to develop and for the FAA to develop and implement national standards within Part 135 uh, or a similar set of regulations for all air tour operators. So yes, the answer to that, Warren, would be um, yes. We feel that that 135 offers a higher level of safety from a regulatory point of view than just strict 91 and uh, and that's why we've uh, we issued that recommendation in 19 2019 and that's why we reiterated it today and mr chairman the next question is from glenn moyer uh, editor of the balloon federation of america uh, the ntsb is recommending establishment of a safety management system for these part 91 operators yet several of the operators in the accidents cited had some form of SMS. How will the establishment of SMS truly improve safety and not just end up as a book on a shelf to tick off a regulatory box? It's a, it's a great question and it's a concern that I have. <clears throat> and that is one argument against making it mandatory is that it would just be um, uh, just ticking a box, checking a box, and then having the book on the shelf. And so it has to be effective. Any program you have has to be effective. And and so that that's the real trick right there. You can go out and buy an SMS manual, um, you know, from some SMS.com or something. You know, you can you can download something like this. Uh, it really has to be within the within the safety culture of the organization where people want to do the right things and they are doing the right things. Mr. Chairman. And, and, uh, and can I, if you don't mind, can I just follow up with, a, with that was one of the reasons for uh, recommendation six we talk about for this very reason, the FA provide ongoing oversight of SMS so that it simply doesn't become you know, essentially a paper tiger. And that's, that's the reason for those six recommendations now. 
Yes, and that recommendation six does. Thank you, Elliot, for jumping in there. Um, for the revenue passenger carrying operations addressed in the previous recommendation, provide ongoing oversight of each operator's safety management system once established. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, the next question uh, again from Ron, uh, Juan Brown with the Aviation YouTube channel. Um, can you shed some light on why there are so many uh, quote, open, unacceptable, end quote, responses by the FAA to NTSB recommendations? I think that question would best be directed to the FAA. We, we issue our recommendations not just uh, on a whim. We don't just pull these ideas out of thin air. The recommendations that we issue are based on crashes, generally where people have died, families have grieved. And, and, and so, as people have said, our recommendations are written in blood. And so we do want the FAA, we, we, we point out areas where there's deficiencies and we've come up with recommendations that can correct those deficiencies. And, and sometimes we too are flabbergasted at the slow pace that the FAA moves. And I think a good example of that would be the pilot records database that has still not been implemented. And as you heard today, earlier we, we, issued, a, we, we issued a recommendation for mm. commercial balloon operators, people who are operating the privileges of their commercial pilot certificate to have a medical certificate. Uh, that's not even close to being a, a regulation at this point. So yeah, we, we are, we're troubled by the slow pace of the FAA and we call them to step up to the plate and regulate, and our recommendations are important to improving the safety of our national airspace system. And Mr. Chairman, we have two questions left, and they are both about the same thing. Uh, the Windsor Locks, uh, October 2019 B-17, the B-17 crash in Windsor Locks, Connecticut, was referenced in the report. Uh, the question is, uh, when will that report be issued, and will there also be some sort of briefing associated with that? It's a great question. The report that we adopted today will also incorporate the B-17 crash and the Makalea parachute crash. And uh, the board has already adopted each of those and we have packaged them in with this uh, report that we adopted today. So um, to answer the question, within 30 days, um, you should have one package with the report that we that we issued today, that we approved today, along with the B-17 and the Makalea reports that will be published as a part of that. Thank you, sir. And that uh, is all the questions that we have received. So this will conclude uh, the media availability this afternoon. Thank you for participating, everybody. And thanks for your patience with uh, putting up with our technical challenges at the very beginning. We're going to a uh, upload a recording of this entire briefing onto our YouTube channel. We'll try to do that later this afternoon. Um, it's NTSB Gov on YouTube. Uh, you can just Google us if, um, at NTSB uh, YouTube and you'll, you'll it'll bring it right up. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can send them to this following email address, NTSB Media Relations, all one word, no spaces, NTSB Media Relations at NTSB.gov. Uh, our office number is 202-314-6100. Uh, on that number, those will be the duty officers' uh, contact info uh, should you have any urgent requests. Um, follow us at NTSB underscore newsroom for the latest updates on any NTSB activities. Thank you for, for your participation today.